So the first shift in consciousness that I want to impress you with is that all relationships are here to promote mutual evolution. That that is the function, the ultimate function of relationships. It's not one that we all are aware of or committed to or assign ourselves to the task of evolving in a relationship. But it is what relationships are really all about. Do you know that um, the genital prime for young men or men in life is 19 years old? 19 years old. And for women, it's more like in your 40s and even in your 50s before you reach your genital prime. And a lot of men get kind of upset when they hear this. <laughs> what do you mean? Is that it? It's downhill after 19, right? But it's not, is it? If I ask any, I'm, I'm, I assume all of us are over 19 years old. Does it get worse after 19 years old? Does it? No, it doesn't actually because I mean, I'm not talking about genital sex, I'm talking about intimate sex. Because what's required in genital sex is genitals. What's required in intimate sex is another person and your brain. And as we get older, we start differentiating and understanding a different level of what intimacy is all about, and it's not just a measurement of your ability in terms of your virility. So what is differentiation? Differentiation in, in a really, it's, you know, it's a complex idea, but to, to, to bring it down to its basics, it means it's, it's your ability to maintain your sense of self while also being emotionally and or physically close to another human being. Meaning to be close and to be sep an individual at the same time. Not just to be an individual and not be able to be close, or only be able to be close and not be an individual. These two life forces are inside of us and they have to be balanced. And this is where a whole lot of difficulty occurs in relationships. A well-differentiated person can be close without feeling like um, he or she is losing their individuality. And conversely, you can be an individual on your own without losing your sense of your closest to another. That you can feel close even when you're geographically separate. And for the purpose of tonight, folks, I'm going to be, unfortunately, I want to apologize ahead of time because it's, I'm going to be uh, kind of defaulting to a stereotype around men and women. I'll be talking a lot about pursuers and distancers and stereotypically women are the pursuers and men are the distancers and that is not nearly always the case. But in terms of efficiency and even typing this lecture up, to not have to put he and she every time you want to refer to someone, uh, forgive me ahead of time, because I'm, I'm not attempting to be sexist. I'm just trying to present a concept. So for the sake of argument, let, let, can, can we just use the stereotype when I say he, that I'm going to be more referring to men or the uh, um, male energy, if you will, uh, Same-sex relationships can have male and female energy in them. I'm going to be presenting figures. Um, this red part of a uh, human psyche is the part that is self-validating, that has um, their own sense of self. It's the part of me or the part of you that knows this is me, always been me, and always will be me. It's a part of me that I'm not going to negotiate or give up or throw away. It's a part of me that can draw lines about how far I will go with things. And it's a part of me that is self-validating. I don't have to look outside of self in order to sustain this sense of who I am. This is a um, a, our differentiated part of our personality that can sit in the middle of conflictual situations and be comfortable with ambiguity, meaning something is happening and it's, and it's conflictual and maybe there isn't resolution readily available, but you can be comfortable knowing you're not threatened because you know who you are. You have a sense of yourself. This is your authentic self. 
This, this, this part of ourselves can stand on its own two feet. It doesn't mean it's rigid or controlling. It doesn't mean it's being righteous because that's actually still that's about other in a way. It just is. and It gives to itself. And the other one, the other part of me is uh, my undifferentiated self or uh, my fictitious self, the part that I strategically use in life that focuses on other to feel okay, that does not feel comfortable with our, my own sense of self. The more I have to decide, who do I have to be? What do I have to do? What do I have to be to, to survive? What do I have to do to get... A, uh, um, Attention, validation. What do I need out there to feel okay? And there's two types of uh, people that are other validated. We have two different styles. And you are in one or the other. And all relationships have a combination of both of these things. The first one is the pursuer. The pursuer is um, in need. I got to have you to reflect a self back to me. I need you to talk to me. I need you to give me a me. I need you to need me. If I am needed, I will feel secure. If I am needed, maybe I'll eventually be wanted. I will do everything, just fill me up. I am nothing without you. This other validating uh, part is so focused on filling oneself up with the other in need it overfunctions all of the time. To, with a plan being ultimately, I'm going to get a self reflected back to me because I don't feel comfortable within myself. I need to be completed by something or someone. For, for these people, the relationship with other is more important than their relationship with themselves. And that is trouble. So that's the pursuer. The distancer, although he presents as somebody that is running all of the time, he is just as consumed by the focus on other as the pursuer is. I'll tell you more about how that develops soon, but the distancer is always focusing on to make sure you're never too close. But still always being wanting to get approval and acceptance. But from a distance, the pursuer is controlling and under-functioning. Under-functioning, only putting in the minimum required to keep the thing going. And the... the the distancer establishes all the rules, and they may not even be stated. But the distancer makes the relationship only go as fast as the distancer can go. The distancer wants safety, and the distancer establishes all the rules, the important rules, and is always in need of space, protecting space in order to recover a self. in fear of losing himself. Right? That's me. That was the untouchable in high school. And the distancer is always certain the way it actually, things the way, the, the way things actually are. He's not curious. He's not asking questions. He's just making statements. The distancer determines how close you can be when you have sex or if you have sex. 
Maybe even how you have sex. How much time together is okay and tolerable. What you can talk about, if you can talk about anything at all. And under functions, time needed away with the kind of implicit promise to the pursuer, if you don't bother me too much, I will do things for you. A lot of heads nodding here. So both are watching the other. There's the pursuer and the distancer. This is the blue area covering the authentic self, the part of us that meets the world. But in relationship, both are watching the other in uh, fear. Either is they're keeping a distance to salvage and manage anxiety all the time. That's what the distancer is up to. That was me. Or in, in, in the other case, to, uh, to, 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 to be close enough to get a, 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 a self-reflected back to her, and that was Catherine. And yet, the, the interesting thing about this is we are both the same. We may look totally different. We're, we're equal and we're opposite. We are people with the same level of differentiation the size of who we are inside is the same. And how did we get this way? How do you become differentiated or undifferentiated? What is your level of differentiation? I'm sure you're beginning to reflect on that. Which one, where do you sit in all that? We have to ask ourselves the question, if you, want to, if you want a quick under, uh, view of answering that question about your level of differentiation, ask yourself this question. Did your family work towards promoting your individuality? Or did you work to preserve the status quo of your family system? Who worked for who? Who did you have to become to get approval and acceptance, or was it just a given? What did you have to change in you in order to get approval and acceptance, or was it just a given? If you had to work to, towards getting an approval and acceptance in your family system, you are always going to be on guard. You'll always be wondering, am, am I getting it? Because you will need it. You will be in strategy. So here is Catherine and I. Now let me tell you a little bit about Catherine, and then I'll tell you a little bit about myself. And being the distancer, I'll tell you a whole lot more about Catherine than I'll tell you about myself. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. I got more text here than she does. So Catherine, it's a marvelous process, this whole thing. Like when, I, when I'm lecturing about this, it, this isn't just some sort of thing that we figured out a number of years ago. It's an ongoing process, right till last night. It's fantastic. Catherine grew up in a home. She was the oldest. She had a younger brother, a couple of years younger than her. And her dad was always traveling. Um, when her brother was born, she was kind of displaced. Catherine's blue was that she feared that she didn't matter with a father that was gone three weeks out of every month, traveling as a social worker in, in, in northern Ontario. And her brother came along, he was colicky, and all the attention went on the brother. And she was kind of left there where she spent a good part of her, her early life, right into adolescence, in, 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 with friends as well. Always fearing abandonment and learning from her family system that in the blue, that she had to move the goalposts, she had to adjust in order to get whatever approval and acceptance was available. Given how busy her father was, and he also had migraine headaches, and how much attention her, her younger brother required, she became the nice girl reading 
who she had to be in order to get it in that moment. She was, as other, she was other validated on her survival to the same extent as I'll show you in a minute as I was. She looked for overt acceptance. For men to reflect a self back to her. She read lots of romance novels. Still to this day, she will not watch a movie that if it does not have a good ending. <laughs> <laughs> in her early years she knew more about needing than actually loving and for a lot of us we don't know the difference between those two things we think they're the same they're not even remotely the same thing so she was just really taken by a lot of romantic ideation willing to do anything to make a relationship work with the ultimate hope that if she became necessary and is needed, that she would ultimately eventually want to be wanted. Very active in her. Very active when I met her. I grew up in an alcoholic home um, with three sisters and spent a whole lot of time rescuing women. But I also grew up in a, a profound state of shame about what was going on in my family with this when my father drank. Many of you have heard uh, those stories already, and I don't have to go into detail about them, just that they were absolutely horrific, and that I grew up really believing that, one, that there's something drastically wrong with me and us. Two, that um, there's no room for me in the need of rescuing others. My role in my family was to rescue everyone. I became the little daddy. I became the super boy. But I had a fear always running as I started entering adolescence of being engulfed by women, the needs of women, that I would be swept by, I'd lose myself. I don't know how conscious, I don't know if that was really conscious, but it was very, very active. That I have to run to keep myself. In this, in this blue region, this strategic blue region, I have fears that if a woman got close, she would not love me, but would find out how defective I actually truly was. So I'd have to keep, better to keep the facade up and alive and be in, just have that relating, because that works. But if they got too close, one, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to lose myself, and two, they're going to find out what a piece of crap that I actually am. So I became the untouchable. At the same time, you know, and, 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 and I was also a Catholic. Now, I, I just want to throw this into the mix because we're talking about intimacy here tonight. Now, all these things that, that, that impact this influence on the outside of gaining approval and acceptance. We were Catholics. We went to Catholic church. I was an altar boy. And how many Catholics do we have in the room here tonight? They're all on this side. Um, do you know who the, the ultimate woman is? In Catholicism? The Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary. The vir Virgin Mary. Virgin Mary. <laughs> the ultimate woman doesn't have sex. They don't tell you that. They just tell you about the Immaculate Conception. That must have been quite a day when Mary came home and said, I'm pregnant, and God did it, Joseph. true. It's true, Joseph. You've got to believe me. The ultimate man is a priest. And guess what priests can't do? They can't have a relationship. They can't have sex. They're celibate. The ultimate woman is a virgin. The ultimate man is celibate. Now, they don't tell you that. 
But you know that. You feel that. The first time I had uh, uh, grade, but grade 12, it was with my, the, the girl I was going to the grad with, and we had a party, and we ended up, you know, in grade 12, I'm a little more sophisticated. We went beyond kissing. Now we're, you know, into taking clothes off, and I'm, I am going for the gusto with disrobing her, and I stopped it, and I broke down crying, and I apologized. Can you believe that? (laughs) This is also with the best looking girl in the high school. I apologized. She shook her head. She wasn't upset, you know, that what was happening. She was upset that I was leaving. Big influences. So there was a tremendous amount, like, I ran into so much uh, inside of me when I was getting close to another. And uh, yet here is what happens when two people meet, right? They come out briefly from their hiding behind their blue defenses and strategies, and they peek out. And it's really exciting It's like it's an open, clear view, undefended, and it's rich, and it's new, and it's hopeful. There's so much to talk about. You know, every time, you know, Catherine and I do a tremendous amount of couples counseling, and we do a history on a relationship, one of the things we always hear about the description of the first courting period is we, we seem to be able to talk forever. We talked all night. We celebrate in this moment. It's like as if everything is common. I was at a party once, and this is an absolute true story, and watching these two people at a party poking out and getting excited about each other, and she said, and part of her story said, I, you know, I, I went to high school in Cologne, and he turned to me and said, I can't believe it, I went to high school too. <laughs> true story. And so all is wonderful. You like the, the first two weeks of, for me, the, at this stage was, you know, we spent all, our entire time in bed. <laughs> Just celebrating this idea that, it, it, that anything is possible. And then you fall in love. And that's where the problems begin. <laughs> and why is that? All of a sudden, this person becomes important. And none of the problems in relationship occur until this person becomes important. Because if they're important now, then they have power. And if they have power, they can hurt you. You are kind of out of control. This per- I need this person, I want this person, I care about this person. I, 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 I want something from this person. And they have now power. And we get scared because we remember the last time someone was important, whether that be in the last relationship or in your family system. What happens when somebody's important? Sadly, we start to see our past more than what's in front of us. In a way, we kind of resent the other. That they have the power. Like, you have power. Part of you is my enemy. You 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 better treat your power with respect. But we don't tell the person that. We actually don't want to want because it means they have power. So we start presenting, we start covering up the part of us that wants with maybe I don't want. We don't want to want. All the old strategies start kicking in. It's like the the toolkit that we carried from our families of origin comes into play. It's inevitable.
And so the, the self-validating part of ourselves, the yellow and the red, slowly starts to get replaced by the blue strategic self. The more the person becomes important, the more this takes place. We start backing up. The authentic selves back up. I start looking out cautiously instead of coming out bravely. I start to distance and she starts to pursue. This is what's in her toolkit and this is what's in mine. This is what we learned how to do. I start to distance to keep to, I'm frightened, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose myself, somebody's important, I'm going to get swept up here. I even said to her once, I said, you're going to suck the very life right out of me. <laughs> Doesn't she look like a vulture? <laughs> and she is in, as, as, as fast as I'm running away, she's running forward in pursuit of getting a self reflected back to her. I'm running from being engulfed by that female or mother energy and she's running to get her father. She overfunctions, I underfunctions. She knows how, I know how. So as soon as I become important uh, to Catherine, Catherine started focusing on being a, the, the good girl, the chameleon that adjusted to any of my running around. I started looking out to, or trying to figure out how I could put in the minimal, minimal effort to avoid being swallowed up and losing myself and underfunction. And at the same time, I still wanted the approval. I worked very hard at keeping my distance at the same time, give me your approval because if, if that's where I'm other focused, I need her approval. Because if I don't get her approval, then it's like I'm my father. One way for her to get me running back is to disapprove of me, to leave the room. It's one of the biggest things that she'd ever get, get on me. So we'd be in the middle of something and she would just get up and leave the room and I would just die. I am being rejected. I am bad. And I would chase her to the other room. And I am distancing with this kind of impression, this kind of message to her that you're not important. Right? I don't want to want. I don't want to want. And I'm going to convey the message, you know, you're not important. But I am not distancing because she's not important. I am distancing because she is. And if all of you reflecting in your own relationships about the distancer, think about that. He's, he's not or she's not distancing because you're not important. He or she's distancing because you actually are, because they have to. That's how much power you have. And so, again, in this stereotype, and I want you to hold on to this one, because when, 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 this, when this one came through me, it just kind of summarized this whole dynamic that goes on in relationships. Men, for the most part, fall into the category of sacrificing major aspects of a we to have a me. And women, for the most part, sacrifice major aspects of a me in order to have a we. And both are extremely defeating in the long run. So this is really important to understand. This, will, this dynamic of what I'm talking about here will explain more of the dysfunction that goes on, goes on in the relationship than 99% than of the books we read about dysfunction in relationship. This underlying dynamic of lowly differentiated cells trying to figure out how to survive or get what they think they need. It's very important to understand. And none of this kicks in until somebody's important. So I'm sure you could say, you know, I'm never like that with my friends. 
I never liked that at work. I never liked that at a nightclub. It's really frightening when somebody has power. And I, well, what I want to impress on you before the end of the evening as well is appreciate how much power you have if you're in a relationship. And to really think about how impa- how, what a, a special privilege that is to have that amount of power with somebody and start re- re- respecting it. So incrementally over time, you know, we become more and more important to each other. Get a house, you have kids, have a mortgage, start a business together. More and more importance and the other person is having more and more power and, and you will thus have more and more fears from your undifferentiated self that runs, for me, that uh, runs and pleases, doing things. Doing things as a way of trying to keep her close enough to not hurt me to, and distracting her from the real problem that I'm not really close to her. Maybe I can do enough to get her approval without her having to get too close to me. But the real me is kept hidden through all of that. And the same for her. She seeks desires and needs profoundly and represents it with this nice girl. But this is her strategic self, not her real self. And the nice girl can also get angry in her unique kind of way which nice girls can do, too. The strategies stop working and it just doesn't pay off and you finally blow up and you have a big scene. But in, tr- in truth, underneath it all, what we're experiencing is the other one has power and we're at each other's mercy. And we don't want them to know that. We keep trying to convince yourself that you, the other one doesn't have power or convince the other one they don't have power. Get safe. Somehow getting your power back. So incrementally, Catherine juggles more and more ch- ch- chameleon-type strategies on getting me back. We know each other's facade. We're, I'm not just talking about her and I here. I'm talking about everybody. This is the process we all go through. We know each other's facade. We function from it. Rather than who we really are in it, we become roles in the blue. For her, for sure, is, you know, um, I will become necessary. I will make sure, I'll make Dwayne need me. Again, in the hope that maybe I'll, Dwayne will want me. And sadly, sadly, no matter how successful those strategies are in playing this one out, um, without real authentic people in the relationship, the relationship begins to die. It becomes bankrupt at every level. There's more withdrawn from it than put into it. And the only thing you can put into a relationship to make it work is your real self. And on the surface with Catherine and I, she looked like the one that was able and um, willing and open and I looked like the one that was ca- causing all the problems. But we were actually both equally gridlocked. Can you, can you appreciate that? Can you see that? That it's not just the distancer that is the problem. You know, the pursuer has this, is driven by the same anxiety, but in a different way. I've often said, you know, like for all the pursuers out there, why don't you choose to be in a relationship with another pursuer? Wouldn't it be just blissful? <laughs> you could just pursue each other all day long and give each other all day long. Wouldn't it be just wonderful? And your friends introduce somebody like that to you and you're not interested. There's no chemistry. It's because you are equally terrified about intimacy as the pursuer. And the pursuer keeps you, or a distancer, because being with a distancer, it keeps you safe. You can explain your own difficulty with intimacy by their actions.
But the, you know, the, the fears and fantasy and projections are just so alive here. We up, up, uh, turn up our strategies. Hers is for that romantic ending, and I'm fantasizing about her not being so anxious. My fantasy is that I'm not going to have to feel guilt. Just be nice was my battle cry. But while we're both doing that, we're equally presenting an unauthentic self and equally focused on the other for validation. I hope that's beginning to make sense to you because it's really important to to break that myth and know that you are who you sleep with. This is also a time for it's highly anxious um, that all kinds of symptoms start showing up here of addictions, affairs, fighting. It gets kind of desperate. One says, I need you. The other one says, I need space. That's what we did. But again, both of us are kind of um, uh, holding the other one as having so much power. And thus we are both powerless in the middle of this situation because this other one is important. And we're both upset because being so other-focused, other other-validating-focused, other We get upset at the other one because they're not playing by the rules that you thought this relationship was for and the agreement to satisfy your blue fantasy of what you think you need. This is when sex becomes routine or just going through the the, the motions, the battleground of having to play this out that's happening all day long in your relationship now gets personified in the bedroom. The need for the distancer to be safe can become... um, He can become sexually uninterested, so it seems. So we're going to hear people say, well, I love you, but I'm just not in love with you. How can you be? Look, what part of you is in the relationship? That part, that blue part cannot feel love, only fear. And you may think you have a sexual dysfunction or a problem. For the most part in situations like this, this, this is not a sexual problem. This is an intimacy problem. This is a, a differentiation problem. This has more to do with differentiation, how you play it out, how you have to guard and defend yourself and seek um, validation in the way you think you need it than anything else. And it's a conversation that normally doesn't take place in your discussion around what the problems are in the household or the bedroom. Oh. And this is when, when, you know, We turn to solutions that sometimes can be ridiculous um, and missing the point. There's many therapies that make the mistake of prescribing to the other to give what the other's blue is needing. For example, give him more space to give him what he wants. Or you, she doesn't feel important, give her flowers. That's the solution. That's the problem. You're reinforcing the very thing that's created the problem by romanticizing the problem. There's a thing called um, sensate-focused therapy, sexual therapy. Anybody aware of what that is? It's... It's, um, you know, it's, there's, on, on the surface, there's actually nothing wrong. It's, it's kind of a, a lovely thing where two people will get together and one person will close their eyes and just be totally aware of touch. The sensation, the kinesthetic ses- sensation and 
the reverberation of feelings that erupt in your body, and it's very autoerotic. And it's, it's, a, it's a technique that is prescribed for couples that are having difficulty. And it kind of bothers me in a way, because the, the very problem is actually there is no connection to begin with, and now you're prescribing something that's kind of desperate to get a sensation that has been buried underneath this blue by removing the very person, closing your eyes, and only being focusing on touch as opposed to the person that's touching you. To me, is very self-defeating and missing the point. This is an intimacy problem, not a kinesthetic one. So the blue cannot be um, intimate. It only sees what it fears. It gets passive-aggressive. Hmm. And here... Um, Is it close to where the relationship can be coming possibly to an end? There's just so little of what's required to make it work still present in the relationship and it's, and it's more uh, fear-based entirely. I'm sorry to be going through all the nasty stuff. There's a lot of good stuff coming. But here's where that, you know, the... the Underlying communication all the time is, you know, you are uh, the enemy or you are not giving me what I want and you are the problem and it becomes pervasive in every aspect of your life from the living room to the bedroom. You become very quiet and passive-aggressive, just communicate all the time. I'm not going to say goodnight anymore. A lot of people here will, will start thinking that they, they have an attraction problem to each I'm not attracted anymore. It's not an attraction problem. It's a differentiation problem. Here, for me, you know, is... is um, at, at our worst place in our relationship, this, this, this was me just reasserting my, my... trying to convince myself that, I, that she isn't important and that I just need to be reestablish the rules of engagement here around independence and in the fear, the profound fear that I was not communicating that I am so frightened of losing myself. In fact, I'm so frightened that I have lost myself and you've done it to me. The relationship is a problem. Perhaps leaving the relationship is the solution so I can get myself back. So this kind of rescue mission around the, our blue parts doesn't work. No matter what strategy we have in there, it ain't going to help. Because the yellow and the red are not involved. And conversely, you know, when you hear somebody say, I will die for you. That's how much I love you. That isn't a good thing. And they almost mean it. I would do anything. That's how much I love you. That's not how much I love you. That's how much I need you. Don't be flattered by that. And don't think it's a romantic communication. It's a profoundly self-attacking one. That my relationship with you is actually more important than my entire life. This level of, of, of interaction between two people hardly knows the difference between being in love and being in need. They don't know there is one. So, as I said, the temptation is to address the symptoms over and over and over again or to end the relationship. And the answer is not to address sexual issues on the level of sex itself if there's sexual problems or intimacy problems, 
but more to examine the dynamic if you are the pursuer to ask yourself how much of your individuality do you give up in order to preserve a sense of relationship? That's the problem. The very thing you give up is the very thing that's required to make it work. You don't know that. How much of your sense of individuality do you give up in order to preserve a sense of relationship? And conversely, for the distancers, how much of a sense of closeness do you give up in order to preserve a sense of self? The symptoms from this are many at every level in the relationship. In conversation, at the dinner table, in the living room, it's all personif and personified in the bedroom, as I've said before. Because there's two levels of conversation going on all the time. You could still be, you know, not talking about anything. But this is very alive. And you could be talking about um, inviting your friend over for dinner tonight. What do you think she would like for dinner? Oh, I don't know. Maybe a nice spinach salad and, and um, some mango on top of it. Well, that'd be nice. You could having this kind of conversation, but underneath it all... You're going to be having a conversation about what you are thinking about the other. It will be embedded in every syllable and every tonality, every body position. You are having an ongoing conversation about who owes who what. It's very sad. It's just not an honest conversation at all. And the latter stages are when the fights actually stop and indifference sets in. She stops pursuing, like, I'm giving up, doesn't communicate, but I'm just, she just stops pursuing. And actually for him, a lot of the time he thinks, oh, finally, she's off my back. Peace at last. <laughs> doesn't realize it's close to the end. So he stops running, he just lives in his hiding place. It might be in his own bedroom now. Or he spends more time in the shed or with the boys. And she might be starting a second career, right? Changing focus. Still in the same household. Maybe they're just so obligated to so many things together. It's just two people coexisting together in structure and function, but not in relationship. She has new, gets new friends, hobbies. I remember when my mother got her driver's license at 35 years old, my dad freaked Just starting to step outside the, whatever box they had in. But both just hide. This is the couple that is not talking at the restaurant. And I'll tell you, they're not talking because there's nothing to talk about. There's, they're not talking because there's too much to talk about. But they're not talking about it. They're playing it out in other ways. No sex at worst, mechanical sex at best. Or it, gets, it can also get desperate sexually, where all of a sudden it gets weird, crazy sex to try and th get things going. <laughs> Not realizing how far that is from what the real problem is. No one is there. Nobody's minding the store. Only the roles and the routines. No curiosity, only certainty. It's like we've given up even wondering about, we think we know each other now. Done. You don't know each other at all. You don't even know who's there. So, here are what the options have been up to this point. You know, initially the pursuer... As the pursuer, I will violate my own integrity, or Catherine as the pursuer, violate her own integrity by giving up major aspects of herself to accommodate the, uh, the other, me, the we. And I, as the distancer, I will make the other violate herself in order to accommodate me and my rules in the relationship.
So in the, in the latter stages, um, we're just separate emotionally and physically. And we just live in indifference in a shell of a relationship, but not actually in one. So let's get to the good news, shall we? I'm sorry, but I had to go to the full length of this because I, this is, this, you know, I'm not doing this because I'm trying to exaggerate what goes on in a relationship. I think it's quite um, sad what goes on in a relationship. And it's never spoken about or exposed to this extent about what we can do to each other and do to each other with the mis- misusing the power we have. And we're the only one that have that power with this person. And we hit them where it hurts. So time, it's time to reflect instead of reload. This isn't a time to leave. <laughs> so let's read this. Here is the self-validated, intimate uh, uh, mantra of a relationship. I don't expect you to agree with me. You weren't put on this planet to validate and reinforce me. But I want you to love me. And you can't really do that if you don't know me. I don't want your rejection, but I must face that possibility if I'm ever to feel accepted or secure with you. It's time to show myself to you and to confront my separateness and my mortality. One day when we are no longer together on this earth, I want to know that you knew me. That's a person entering a relationship that is willing to be close and himself or herself having sovereignty, dismissing the debt sheet about another having to validate you to make you feel better about yourself, that this is an inside job that isn't going to be uh, held back from the partner, but more let the partner witness my wrestling match with my own inside life. That's intimacy, is witnessing our each other's dilemma instead of being blamed for the dilemma or being told that you are the solution to the dilemma. You are not the problem and you are not the solution. And in our lowly differentiated state, we are totally convinced that the other is the problem and the solution. They're not. So tip number two. Your level of differentiation has to keep pace with the level of growing importance the other has with you. As a person becomes more and more important, you have to grow as much as the person is becoming important. Rather than stopping and defaulting to some old system and some old way of looking at yourself and at life and at relationship that you got from your family. And grow and become more of who you are to meet how important this person has become. The importance the other has with you is, is really asking you to grow. Will you do that now? Can you do that now? Can you be conscious enough to realize that is the task? Grow where no one in your family system has grown before or gone before or not. This is where you have the opportunity to evolve or not. You have to ask yourself, what is your choice there? And I can't, I can't present it more graphically or more cleanly, really. Getting rid of, rid of all the garbly gook on top of it and all the muddle and new age ways of viewing our situation, this is bringing it down to how shall I use this relationship now? Who shall I be in it and what am I going to do in it? So these are the requirements to actually differentiate and become truly intimate. 
You have to be willing to confront yourself instead of the other. You have to have self-disclosure about reporting what is underneath the blue strategy behaviors, what lies underneath that in terms of your beliefs about yourself. She is nice and the overfunctioner because she believes what about herself? I am running and scared. I'm running and taking control because I believe what about myself? So self-disclosure instead of trying to read the other and tell the other what their problem is. One of our rules in our work here is my opinion of you is none of your business. You want to save 95% of your problems in a relationship? Put that on your wall. My opinion of you is none of your business. Because the only time the opinion comes out is when you're upset. And it's a weapon. And you have no right to speak, actually. Because you just want to hurt. So with, with Catherine and I, you know, we've had many intervals in this process. And it is, it is stopping. Like it's just a, it, this is a lifelong process. It's a wonderful process. I had to enter a relationship to learn how to be in one. I am no longer the untouchable. I am no longer the runner. I meet myself in all of these things. And I, and I just like you, can spend just as much time avoiding the real work as doing it. Scary business. We both have to dig deep and reach down and get a hold of, for me, to get a hold of myself instead of getting a hold of the doorknob. And Catherine has to dig down deep and get a hold of herself instead of me. So here's Catherine and I, back to our story. It came to a real critical place uh, a number of years ago where my controller, my um, setting the rules in the relationship, my need for distance was one of my greatest tricks. And again, it wasn't conscious, but one way of alleviating the conflict it would be to scare her. And I would say, you know, I don't know if this is working out, Catherine. And when I said that, I had no intention of ending the relationship. All I knew was it worked. That's pretty bad. But I was scared, and whatever I had to do in order to get safe, I did. And we do. It's really unfair. Because what am I doing? When I, you know, when I say we, get, we have power with each other, we hit, hit each other where it hurts, I am the only one that has power with her there, and now I'm going to threaten to abandon her? And that's her Achilles heel to begin with. She's going to leave the room and, and reject me, knowing that that's my Achilles heel. That's where I'll, I'll, you can really get me. You, you're like your father. And we'll get each other there as a weapon. Anyways, I said this. You know, maybe this isn't working out, Catherine. And she would normally just put it on another chameleon behavior and act and just make it all okay. Move the goalposts. But instead, she turned to me and said, Dwayne, the next time you say that, I'm going to believe you. This was a game changer. She dug in deep, got a hold of herself, asking herself, you know, really, what's the point of being here if I'm actually causing this man, if I'm making him unhappy? If he really wants to leave, maybe, you know, in all love for him, maybe I should let him. Maybe I should stop trying to convince somebody what they don't want to do and respect that. So she said, the next time you say that, it's, it's a deal. And it stopped me dead in my tracks. The game was over. She, sung, she brought herself into the relationship. It was very brave of her. And I stood there, and I think for two days. I thought it was for an hour, but she claims it was two days before I answered. 
And I reflected rather than reloaded. Reflected. What is going on for me? What's really happening here? What an irresponsible person I am. What an emotionally irresponsible person I am that I dare to let her assume the responsibility of explaining the difficulty in the relationship because she's being problematic and therefore I'm going to go. How bloody immature. How sensationally emotionally irresponsible. What an abuse of my power. And how frightened I was underneath it all. So instead, I confessed to Catherine. This is me showing up. Confess what's inside. I told her that I, I confess that I have a fear of losing myself and have my whole life. And my, I told, started telling her the whole story with my sisters and everything that happened to my dad and my drinking and, and how I just was not one that came out of high school looking for, I can't wait to get married and have a family. No, I just wanted to go to the world. I just wanted to get out in the world in order to preserve myself, that family relationships would just eat me up. I told her about the religion thing and guilt of what goes on for me around the guilt around uh, uh, having any sexual desires whatsoever. My fear of criticism, I confess that, what criticism actually does to me. Not as a dictum to her to stop criticizing me, more to say, this is what the button you press in me that you, you're not responsible for, you're just touching it. What gets activated in me is me. I confess that this is my problem. I confessed to her how much I needed her approval, but never told her. I just pretended I didn't need it. And on the flip side of this, I also confessed how much I care and love her and refused to really let her know that. I confess how frightened ultimately that I will be rejected. How, uh, despite her wonderful values and protocol and emotional responsibility, how frightened I am that she still could abuse her power with me. I got a hold of myself rather than getting a hold of the door or more control. She got a hold of herself rather than a hold of me, like I said. She confessed how little she considers herself. And she wasn't blaming me for that. She said, I don't consider myself and I train others not to consider me either. And how much she needed someone, me, to give her a self. And how unfair that was. And here was the one that really, really changed her life and is still resonating with her. She confessed that her pursuing personality to be needed, right? Irreplaceable, necessary, needed. I'm going to make you need me. Is designed to be wanted. That that's her ultimate goal. And she realizes how that could actually never happen. Because the only part of me that she is letting me know about is the role, the one that is needed, which is not her, that's a role, that's not who she is. And that to be wanted is her authentic self, but if her authentic self was never in the relationship, how could I ever want it? I'm not in relationship with it. This is a game changer for Catherine. That she has to bring her real self into the If she wants to be wanted, then she better bring the part of her that is going to receive that into the relationship because it wasn't there. And for me, 
it became the life changer for me was, you know, again, so many therapies for guys like me would be encouraging her to give me space and allow me to do this and blah, blah, blah. When really the task for me, the task for me is to be an individual, but to be an individual when I'm close. Not just when I have to, I have to get away to get my individuality, but to actually be an individual, be myself while I am being close. That's my task. That's where I have to t- differentiate to the degree that she's becoming important to me. Can I be myself in the presence of all that stuff running? What a concept. That's the only thing for me to do. That's the only thing for me to focus on. Not how I explain how I can't be myself because you're this and you're that. That's why I can't be myself. You, you know, it's because of you. And how, how preoccupied we are in explaining our pain by so much outside of ourselves and missing the boat entirely. I say, save yourself years and years and years and years. Let's get to work. That's what we do in our awakening workshops. It's like, let's, let's get to the real problem, shall we? The real one. So, the growth uh, and the individuation and, and differentiation in this relationship is all fueled by confession, confession, confession. Confessing the answers to these questions. How close can I get to Catherine before I start having a sense of losing myself and her with me? Who did I become and what did I do in there? And also confessing what is the cost of all that crazy behavior? To be able to talk about that, that's a very, very sober conversation, a very real conversation that not many people are prepared to have. But what a powerful conversation it is. You want to get life in your relationship? Answer some of these questions. It's not talking about the other at all. It's only talking about you and what you have done and what your own relationship with yourself and what you are up to. You can be known. There is nothing more exhilarating than actually finally being known in a non-blaming... I'm just talking about me here. Somebody knows me. Somebody sees me. I am being emotionally responsible. And confessing... You know, my biggest confession was, was like I said, like it had reached so many levels, but I really had to go back into what it, what, what, what it was like for me and at my home. where I grew up, my past relationships and Catholicism, they're big ones, they're huge. So confessing, remember there's, both, there's two sides to that confession, there's the stuff that I want to kind of atone for, what I've been up to, and also how much I love, and have, have, have withheld that communication in fear that if you know how much I love you, how much you thou can hurt me how much power I'm going to give you. And so part of that confession is just to talk about how scary it is to have somebody be important again. Most people don't want to talk about that. So to be known, stepping closer. So intimacy has two essential ingredients, and that's confronting yourself and self-disclosure. And in our work, in the Awakening Workshop, if you, do, if you please, seriously consider it. Life changer. You're taught a process called the four-step getting real process, which walks through this whole process, basically. And I tell you, there is no sex like sex after a four-step. <laughs> no matter how scary it is, or how much it's opened up, and how, uh, it's alive. And you are now one person in the relationship. When you are one person in the relationship and you go to bed with your partner who is one person and all of who she is and all of who you are, (laughs) yeah, 
So more of me started to show up and is still showing up in this process. We start to get a new view. The authentic self starts growing, differentiating, becoming, representing more of who we are in the relationship on a day-to-day basis, on all aspects of the relationship on a day-to-day basis. Not just in the bedroom, but the living room, the kitchen, driving the kids to school, at work, everything, on the phone, texting. There is loving, authentic, real messages being conveyed that are not defended and hidden. So those hands of Catherine's coming closer to me now do not mean that she's going to steal something from me, but actually wanting to love me because she knows the difference between love and need now too. Big shift. And it brought back all my memories, all the way back to that girl in high school. Her name was Connie. Connie. You know, I thought about her, and I even I contacted her. She's a, she's a sister of a good friend of mine. I told her about this a few months ago. And what was really going on for me there? It's nice to know. It's nice to understand. So we are, you know, we're successful in making the battleground not in the relationship, in other validated intimacy, The battleground is in self. And when you take the awakening workshop, that's what we pray. And, you know, by and large, that's where people are, is they understand what that means. They know what the real problem is. The The battleground is in self. And the amount of craziness that goes on outside of self decreases profoundly. And so more of me uh, became and continues to become available and also my view of her. And it continues to evolve. It's like there's no ceiling on this. Like, our success and your success can simply be measured by the extent that our level of differentiation actually does keep pace with the level of importance the other one is to you. And it continues to grow until this strategic self is almost gone. So... In this continued conversation, to haiku it down to even two more basic questions from the ones I just gave you, it's to be able to talk about, without defense or strategy or outcome in mind, where did you come from and who have you been 